Hello and welcome to the Friday podcast. So on uh, Tuesday, I did a podcast on the original meaning of Isaiah 41 through 8. In that video or and podcast, I two forms of it, um, I basically talked about the original meaning of Isaiah 40 in its context in the ancient Near East. And of course, that was the return of, of the Jews from captivity in Babylon. Comfort, comfort my people, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, make a beeline. We're coming back from Babylon uh, to Jerusalem. And that, I believe, is the original meaning uh, of Isaiah 40. However, what I want to talk about in today's podcast is how the New Testament looked at these verses. As you'll find out, and this is the format I, I think I'm going to follow, that when, when on Tuesday I look at a passage that the New Testament also engages. So on my Tuesday podcast, I'll look at the original meaning of Isaiah in context. That is, how would an ancient Israelite have read these verses? Or what was likely in the bubble above Isaiah's head or whoever the author of this section was, depending on how you uh, d uh, decide the, the timing of the writing of Isaiah 40 through 66 was, uh, however you, whatever you think there, what was in the bubble above the author's head in the Old Testament times? And that'll be Tuesday's podcast. And then on in, in instances like today where the New Testament significantly engages the passage, then on Friday we'll look at how the New Testament looks at it. And what you'll discover is that, uh, as, as I would say probably most scholars would say, there is a near meaning, they might not put it like this, but there was a near meaning in the ancient Near East in the Old Testament times. And then often there was a kind of a, a second interpretation or a spiritual interpretation done by the New Testament authors or a, sen a census plenier, uh, as um, um, I believe it was Raymond Brown who coined that Latin phrase. Maybe, maybe he didn't coin it, but he made it popular in the 20th century. The idea of a fuller sense. I know my grandfather talked about the near and the far of the Old Testament, uh, and so the near would relate to the, uh, the prophet, uh, the time of the prophet, and the far would relate to either uh, uh, our times or, or the times of the New Testament. Uh, I think uh, Steve Lennox in his Old Testament survey suggests that probably less than 1% of the Old Testament wasn't fulfilled by the time of Jesus or in, in, the, in the days of the New Testament that actually very little of the Old Testament is yet to be fulfilled. Um, and, and that actually not, not much of the Old Testament actually was about the time of the New Testament either. Um, but um, I've developed an understanding. Uh, first of all, I want, to, I want to listen to Isaiah in context. I want to let Isaiah speak. I want to hear Isaiah inductively. So there's that, that part of it. But then the New Testament uh, with spiritual glasses on, and with the eyes of the New Covenant on, the New Testament reads these verses in a Jesus sense. They have Jesus glasses on, and they read these verses in Jesus ways. I consider both of these interpretations to be valid. I consider both of these interpretations to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, and therefore without error, with, uh, unfailing, and, and so forth. However, what I've come to believe is that it was perfectly appropriate at the time, uh, especially given the nature of Jewish exegesis, it was perfectly appropriate for the New Testament authors to read the Old Testament in super ways, in ways that went beyond the original meaning. They, they may map to the original meaning, there may be resonances with the original meaning, um, but, but I, felt, I feel like, and this is not a feel, this is actually based upon the uh, evidence of interpretation and exegesis, that the New Testament authors were free in the Holy Spirit to read the Old Testament in ways that the original Old Testament authors would have never imagined. The, the author of Hosea, for example, would have never imagined um, that um, Matthew would read the comment about when Israel was a child, I called my son out of Egypt. Matthew would have never, or Isaiah, or Hosea would have never imagined that Matthew would read that in relation to Jesus going down to Egypt and coming back out. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with this. Let's just say that the New Testament authors were Pentecostals. They were charismatics. They were old holiness folk. I, I grew up with these kinds of interpretations where we read the Old Testament or the New Testament 
in a spiritual kind of sense. Of course, the danger with that kind of reading is, is that I'm not inspired. Um, the, the New Testament authors were inspired, you know, and so if they read the Old Testament in super contextual ways, ways that went beyond the original meaning, that's okay, they're inspired. How do I know that it's not just the burrito I had for lunch that's leading me to see, you know, this biblical text in a way out of context? And so I think it's good for us to know the contextual meaning of scriptures, the original meaning of scriptures, but um, the New Testament authors, I think, demonstrably, and we'll see this, demonstrably went beyond what the original meaning was. And so let's talk about that. I've taken a lot of, long time to preface this, but let's look at this. So the original meaning of Isaiah 40, I don't think it's even really debatable. I think it's overwhelmingly clear in its ancient Near Eastern context. Isaiah 40 was originally about the return of Israel uh, from captivity in Babylon uh, to, um, to Jerusalem. Now, how did the New Testament take this? Well, we turn to Luke chapter 3, uh, or Mark 1, or Matthew 3, where this passage, the voice of one who cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So what was this about in the New Testament? Well, it's quite clear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that this is about John the Baptist. He's the voice. This is the voice of John the Baptist out in the wilderness crying, prepare the way of Jesus, prepare the way of the Messiah. Now, how does this contrast with Isaiah? Well, Isaiah doesn't mention a specific voice, and the voice is about return from Babylon. It's not about the coming of the Messiah in its original meaning in Isaiah 40. In fact, the Lord in Isaiah 40 is Yahweh, whereas the Lord in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is Jesus, um, who is um, uh, the Messiah Lord, not the Yahweh Lord in this passage. And so the straight paths have to do with preparing the way uh, for the Messiah. Now, John the Baptist did baptize right at the spot uh, where Israel entered into the land uh, with Joshua. And so there were, there were overtones of return. There were overtones of return. Uh, but the return uh, that John the Baptist preached was a more spiritualized return, a return from um, a spiritual exile, as it were. Yes, I suspect that there was a sense that God did want to restore the land of Israel uh, to Israel. I suspect that was part of John the Baptist's message, the idea that Israel could re-enter uh, into the land and retake it and kick the Romans out and that, all that good stuff. Uh, you know, after the resurrection, what did the disciples ask Jesus? So are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So there may have been some of that very literal, concrete uh, return into the land there. Uh, and so that, that would be a fairly close parallel, right? Israel being restored to independence in the land and in the Old Testament, Israel returning from Babylon into the land in a very real and, and concrete kind of way. Uh, but I think the New Testament pushes us to understand this in a spiritual way, a, a more metaphorical way, that we are all in bondage to, we're slaves to sin. And if we wash ourselves of our sins, like John the Baptist washed them in the River Jordan, then we can enter into the spiritual kingdom of God and into the, the, the spiritual people uh, of God. But anyway, so um, these are overtones in the New Testament that are, as it were, they are parallel uh, to the original meaning of, of returning from Babylon, but they are at some remove from it. There, there isn't, so it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, Isaiah 40 is not a prediction of John the Baptist in any kind of a straightforward sense. Rather, John the Baptist is an echo of Isaiah 40, if that, if that makes any sense. There is a fuller, a fulfillment in a way, but it, it's not a prediction fulfillment. It's a echo fulfillment, uh, if you would, in, in that particular case. Well, let me, I want to look at the other place. So uh, that, the, that uh, this, the passages we read on Tuesday are, are echoed. So the last few verses, the last couple verses of Isaiah 40, 1 through 8, are uh, all, so all pe uh, last three verses, all people are grass, they're like the flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades, but when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, um, uh, uh, the people are grass. 
uh, but um, the word of the Lord will stand forever. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Um, and I suggested on Tuesday that perhaps this word of the Lord, word of our God in Isaiah 40, is God's promise uh, in, through prophets like Jeremiah that Israel would one day return from captivity. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of peace to give you a future and a hope. Um, so the word of the Lord was that Israel would return uh, from captivity. And that might be a part of what is being uh, alluded to here uh, in Isaiah 40. Well, there is a New Testament passage that quotes this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. Let me go back to 23. You have been born anew, Peter says, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living word of God. Uh, for all flesh is like grass, uh, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Um, perhaps there's a contrast here between human life, which perishes, and eternal life, which is uh, from the word of the Lord being uh, inside of us. Um, we have the, the word, the logos, inside of us. There's debate over whether uh, Peter has in mind a logos theology here, a logos way of thinking. Uh, the word, the logos inside of us, that is the imperishable seed, the seed that doesn't die, um, that inside of us will, uh, will keep us going forever. Of course, verse 25 says that the word of the Lord is the good news announced uh, to them, uh, which would be the, the good news of Christ, the good news that Jesus is king. Um, but anyway, it's a different word, right? It's not the word, it's not the word of return from exile. Um, it's the good news of eternal life, maybe. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the good news of uh, Christ being king. Uh, this, goes, this is not exactly what Isaiah 40 seems, at least not, it's not clear that Isaiah 40 specifically has that kind of a, of a word in mind. Uh, but, so in a sense, uh, First Peter has read those verses uh, in somewhat of a spiritual uh, sense, but there is a parallel, right? There's a parallel between Isaiah 40 and a parallel uh, with First uh, Peter uh, chapter one, and so this is this is my uh, the thesis that I will I think we will see this over and over again that the New Testament authors are inspired, but they did not feel in any way limited by the original contextual meaning of the Old Testament. They were good charismatics. They were good holiness folk uh, who read the Old Testament spiritually in ways that fit with the context of Jesus. They wore Jesus glasses when they old, the, read, read the Old Testament and spirit glasses uh, when they wrote, read the Old Testament. Well, there are a few reflections on uh, the way that the New Testament authors uh, read uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Um, the, the main uh, places that it's quoted being Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with regard to the first part of those verses, and then here in 1 Peter 1 in the second part of these verses. There you have it. Have a great weekend.